Hey everyone, in this lesson we're going to talk about Chagas disease. So what is Chagas disease? Well, Chagas disease is a disease caused by an infection with a parasitic protozoa known as Trypanosoma cruzi. Now, the Trypanosoma cruzi protozoa is transmitted by an insect of the Triatominae subfamily, and this insect is informally referred to as the kissing bug. And here's a picture of the kissing bug. And the way that the Trypanosoma cruzi protozoa is transmitted from the kissing bug to a person is through the uh, fecal material of the kissing bug coming into contact with the mucosal membrane of the person. Now, um, it's estimated that about 6 million people are infected with uh, Chagas disease. And interestingly, it constitutes the highest parasitic disease um, burden in the Western Hemisphere, even more so than malaria. And here is the estimated range of Chagas disease. Um, anywhere from Mexico or northern Mexico, and some estimates even say parts of southern United States, all the way down to uh, Argentina. This is the range of uh, Chagas disease. So what are some of the stages of Chagas disease? Well, we mentioned that the kissing bug, or the tratamine bug, infects an individual through fecal material. And I didn't mention, though, that the tratamine bug actually will bite an individual first, and then will usually defecate, leaving fecal material behind, which then carries metacyclic tri uh, triple mastigotes. And these Trypanosomes can then enter the bite wound itself, or will enter mucosal membranes such as conjunctiva of the eyes. So when a person perhaps wipes their face, if there's any fecal material on their face, that fecal material can enter into a mucosal membrane such as maybe the mouth, the nose, or the eyes, and usually it's the eyes. And once that occurs, we have metacyclic trypanosomes penetrating into various cells in the person either again at the bite wound site or in the mucosal membrane. Once these uh, metacyclic trypanosomes enter inside the cells, they transform into amastigotes. And the amastigotes can multiply by binary fission in cells and infected tissues. Now these intracellular amastigotes can then transform into trypanosomes which can then burst out of the cell and enter the bloodstream. So after the trypanosomes burst out of the cell and enter the bloodstream there in the general circulation, they can infect other cells and transform again into amastigotes, and they can again multiply in other tissues. Or when these trypanosomes are within the bloodstream, if that person or that patient comes into contact with another tritomine bug, that bug can take another blood meal and itself become infected with the trypanosomes. Once that tritomine bug actually ingests those trypanosomes, epimastigotes are formed within the midgut. So the trypanosomes become epimastigotes within the midgut of the tritomine bug. The epimastigotes then multiply within the midgut. And then once the trypanosomes or the epimastigotes enter the hindgut of the tritomine bug, they become metacyclic trypanosomes. And after they are in the hindgut, once they are removed by defecation um, by the tritomine bug, again, this cycle can continue and the another individual can be infected by these metacyclic trypanosomes in the feces from these bugs. And that continues the cycle. Now, there are a couple specific characteristics of the triatomine bugs. One is that they typically feed at night. So if someone's sleeping outside, the triatomine bug will typically uh, bite the face of an individual. That's why they're called the kissing bug. And then they will defecate. And then that can lead to an infection in an individual. The bugs themselves become infected when they feed on uh, a person or an animal that's infected with the um, trypanosoma cruzi protozoa. And then, like we said, they can continue the cycle by transferring the trypanosoma cruzi protozoa in their feces to a non-infected person or animal. 
Now, with regards to infections in humans, humans can be infected by other means. And one way is through blood transfusion. So you can imagine that if an individual that's giving a blood transfusion has trypanosomiasis uh, within their blood, they can transfer the trypanosomiasis from their blood to another person through a blood transfusion or from uh, uh, blood to blood contact. Another way for humans to be infected is through oral ingestion of the trypanosoma cruzi, uh, usually through uh, oral ingestion of fecal material of the triatomine bug. When an individual is first infected with Chagas disease, there's an incubation period of around one to two weeks. And after that, there's something known as an acute phase, which lasts about eight to 12 weeks. Now, during the acute phase, and an individual can experience what is known as severe acute disease. And this typically only occurs in less than 1% of patients where these patients will experience acute myocarditis, pericardial fusion, and meningoencephalitis. So it's pretty severe. And this acute, severe acute disease usually only occurs in individuals that have been infected through oral transmission. So again, as we mentioned before, through an oral ingestive process. Now, when an individual first becomes infected, there is something known as a chagoma. And the chagoma is something that occurs at the site of infection. And there's also something related to chagoma known as Romania's sign. So a chagoma is the swelling of the, or the first initial swelling of the site of infection. So as I mentioned before, usually uh, individuals can be infected in the conjunctiva of their eyes. So when someone wipes their face or wipes the fecal material of the triatomine bug into their eyes, it can lead to a swelling, uh, a swelling, and that swelling is known as a chagoma. And Romania's sign is when both the upper and lower eyelid are swollen, and that is known as Romania's sign. Now, other than that, most individuals during the acute phase are asymptomatic. But some other um, patients experience nonspecific symptoms such as fever, lymphadenopathy, myalgia, and headache. So it feels like a general illness. So once we pass the 12-week mark of the acute phase, we enter the chronic phase of Chagas disease. And individuals suffering from chronic Chagas disease are considered to have uh, Chagas disease for the rest of their life if they never get treated for it. And about 20 to 30 percent of individuals progress to Chagas heart disease or GI disease by 10 to 30 years. So these uh, these patients can experience symptoms of Chagas disease um, after a prolonged time. So even after 10 to 30 years of being infected with Chagas disease, you can have uh, problems with your heart or problems in the gastrointestinal system. So it's a very chronic and very progressive. Um, condition. Now, with Chagas heart disease, or otherwise known as Chagas cardiomyopathy, it's considered a biventricular heart failure. It can lead to arrhythmias, thromboemboli, ventricular enlargement. It can lead to sudden cardiac arrest. And symptoms of Chagas cardiomyopathy include dyspnea, fatigue, dizziness, syncope, and chest pain. And here's the heart of an individual with Chagas cardiomyopathy. Now with regards to the gastrointestinal disease um, as part of Chagas disease or Chagas gastrointestinal disease, it is an immune mediated tissue damage. So the immune system becomes activated and literally damages the, the gastrointestinal tissues of the patient. It leads to denervation of the Meisner and Auerbach's plexuses. And it leads to, um, in patients during the acute phase, they can have acute symptoms um, such as dysphagia. They start with uh, solids uh, or dysphagia for solid foods, and then they progress to dysphagia for both solids and then liquids. Patients also have abdominal pain and they also have diarrhea. Typically, uh, gastrointestinal disease only occurs in the chronic phase of Chagas disease. We start to get esophageal involvement, so esophageal um, involvement such as again dysphagia so it acts as an achalasia in patients and there are also um, involvement of other areas in the gastrointestinal system such as 
um, colonic involvement, stomach, small intestine, biliary tract, and salivary glands can all be affected um, in Chagas gastrointestinal disease. And I'll briefly mention that in mothers that are infected with Chagas disease, they can pass it on to their um, their their baby after birth. So about one to ten percent of in infants of infected mothers are become infected with a congenital Chagas disease. Most are asymptomatic, but some symptoms of congenital Chagas disease include low birth weight, so usually less than 2,500 grams. Uh, anemia can be another symptom, and hepatosplenomegaly is another symptom in infants infected with congenital Chagas disease. So this is just a brief um, overview of some of the different conditions in, uh, related to Chagas disease, but I will probably get into these conditions in another lesson. So I'll discuss Chagas cardiomyopathy, gastrointestinal disease, and congenital Chagas disease in another lesson because this is just a brief overview of these conditions. Now, how do we diagnose Chagas disease? Well, diagnosis occurs through microscopy or can be diagnosed through microscopy. And this usually occurs in the acute phase when trypanosomiasis are high. So trypanosomiasis are high during the acute phase, but the trypanosomiasis themselves will start to decrease by 90 days. So that renders microscopy very ineffective later on. Now, uh, diagnosis can also occur through polymerase chain reaction or PCR. And again, this is most helpful during the acute phase when trypanosomiasis are high. There is more trypanosomiasis DNA to um, utilize in the polymerase chain reaction. And hemoculture can also um, aid in diagnosis. So you can literally culture the blood of a patient to assess whether there are trypanosomiasis within the blood. So once we've diagnosed Chagas disease, how do we treat it? Well, treatment involves antitrypanosomal medication. And some of the antitrypanosomal medications include benzidazole. Benzidazole is the first line treatment because it is well tolerated or better tolerated than other treatments. The other treatment is nifertamox. Nifertamox is another treatment for Chagas disease, but again, benzidazole is a better um, treatment because it's usually better tolerated, and that's why we use benzidazole as a first-line treatment. Anyways, guys, that was a lesson on Chagas disease. I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, please like and subscribe for more videos like this one. And as always, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.